Firm, and then I'm here to talk about international law and its cyber warfare shortcomings. So, let's start it. So, what is warfare? All right. So, warfare. When you think about warfare, you think kind of uh, you know kind of the D-Day kind of thing. You know, some guys going on a beach, you know, about ready to storm, kill some Nazis, some hula stuff, right? Uh, but the thing is, in today's world, warfare is changing, just like politics is changing. Everything is changing in the age of the internet, in cybersecurity, everything is interconnected, and the definitions of things change. Nowadays, uh, you'll see a good combination of, you know, different kind of hybrid warfares in Afghanistan or Iraq or different war zones across the United, Sta uh, across, ooh, United States. Well, we're, we're there, but not in the United States. Um, but you'll see them across the world. Uh, but also, you'll see... Things like this, you know, uh, hackers, different cyber professionals from different nation states competing against each other in a, con in a contest for information um, and different assets. Uh, and so now you'll see things like uh, America, uh, Russia, China, Israel, all kinds of different countries, uh, non-state actors, state affiliated actors. It's all just giant, one giant web of interconnected stuff that is entirely complex and sometimes a little too hard to figure out. Um, but the one key thing to remember is that cyber warfare and cyber espionage are two very different things. So a lot of times people confuse cyber warfare with something like uh, a Chinese affiliated uh, hacker group or a Russian or even an American, doesn't matter, stealing uh, intellectual property, stealing banking information, stealing whatever it is from some company or organization. But that's not exactly warfare. That's just espionage that happens every day. That's been going on since well, the dawn of ever having any kind of cohesive human group. We steal information from each other. That's what we've done. That's what we'll always do. But cyber warfare is different. It's about either re-engineering a society, as you'll see in different uh, hacks of political systems. One big thing that's always in the news that you can always think of is uh, the DNC hack in 2016 when Russia infiltrated the Democratic National Committee. Um, you'll see other ones in the 2018 election, uh, again, when Russia was still trying to uh, hack the U.S. election. Um, and then you also see different things in multiple different countries across Europe, the U.K., everywhere. You'll see trolls, all kinds of things. And those, in a way, are cyber warfare because it's changing the society. It's trying to influence people on a wider level than just stealing their banking information or uh, doing a DDoS attack on Xbox. It's a totally different thing. Um, but one key thing is also is that cyber warfare has evolved to a point where it's not just about you know, doing a, a troll campaign through a botnet or something like that. It's actually causing physical harm. You know, and that's one of the difficult things because when you think about war, you think about violence. You think about guns, bombs, drone strikes. You think about all kinds of things that cause loss of life. And the reality is, and the way we're going, is that cyber has the ability to do that. It hasn't done it yet, so to speak. You know, there's all kinds of rumor mills on the internet. But we're getting there at some point. And it's really important that international organizations address this issue because it's been kind of left out the No one has been done, doing too much about it. It's kind of worrying. So the international laws of war basically address uh, don't be mean to civilians, okay? Uh, you can't target civilians. You can't target things that they need to survive. You can't use chemical weapons. You can't use biological weapons, viruses, different diseases, nuclear weapons. We have all these treaties, all these international laws of war that change how we fight. Even the, the types of bullets in warfare are actually judged and used. The same type of bullets that we use in, the, in war, such as uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, at least from the American military's perspective, are actually different from the police carry because the police bullets are actually more deadly. For anybody who knows anything about firearms, because the international laws of war prohibit certain types of ammunition types. Um, so they limit a lot of things, but what they don't cover a lot of times is the cyber aspect of things, and they really need to. So a lot of people think about international law, and they think about the need of connection, other things like that. And again, doesn't really cover cyber warfare. When it does, it's not adequate, it's not realistic, it doesn't take into effect the effects it's going to have on our future as an international society or even just a human society. So what the rules of war do? 
So basically, it protects people like civilians, non-combatants, people who are not fighting from being killed. You can't target them. You can't target the water supply, things like that. It prevents uh, things like uh, rape. It, pretend, it prevents things uh, hmm. like for treating prisoners the right way. Like when you get a prisoner of war, you have to treat them a certain way. You have to treat them like you would your own. And all these laws, all these international institutions, these treaties, which there is no other international treaty arranged by any number of organizations or nation states that is more universally recognized than the international laws of war. But they all lack one thing. Again, I keep hitting on this, is cyber. So, again, you can't target civilians. You can't target what they need. You can't tar target water supplies. You can't target infrastructure. But at the same time, there's a thing called proprietary Proportionate actions. Proportionate actions are within reason. So if you're targeting, let's say, terrorists in, I don't know, Islamabad or some country or anywhere, you have to take into consideration what's around the area. What kind of civilian casualties we're running into? Because according to international law and most militaries and governments, a certain amount of civilian casualties is acceptable. But the problem is, not always the case, okay? So you have to justify that by the ends justify the means. You'll see drone strikes on the news. You'll see all kinds of different things about you know the states, England, different NATO coalitions, uh, Russia uh, in multiple places, and Syria doing things that target civilians. And it's not always the, it's not always right. But at the same time, the old ad adverb or saying goes, "It's not what you believe; it's what you can prove in court." Because international law is. At the same time, rigid, it's also flexible because it's open to interpretation. And that is where cyber warfare comes into play. So recently, in 2018, the UN Secretary General, uh, it's uh, Antonio Guterres, I probably uh, pronounced that well, um, <laughs> uh, basically stated this. Okay, He was giving a speech at the University of Lisbon, and this is what he said. Episodes of cyber warfare between states already exist. What is worse is that there is no regulatory scheme for that type of warfare. It is not clear how the Geneva Convention or international humanitarian law applies to it. I am absolutely convinced that, differently from great battles of the past, which opened with a barrage of artillery and aerial bombardment, the next war will begin with a massive cyber attack to destroy military capacity and paralyze basic infrastructure such as electric networks. So that's one of the big buzzwords nowadays is critical infrastructure. You think about power plants, you think about dams, you think about uh, the 5G network with the Huawei incident that's been all over the news. Okay, You think about these important things that we depend on for everyday life. If a hospital loses electricity, who's affected? Is it the military? No. It's the civilians that are affected. It's the people who are sick. It's the people who are hurting. And that's the kind of things that when you target criminal infrastructure with a cyber attack, you run into. So a couple ones. Stand, uh, come out. I've only mentioned a couple, but there are numerous examples. You can go on Google. The CSIS, the Center for National Security Studies, is a massive list of different cyber attacks across the world that are non state, state affiliated, affiliated with different criminal networks. But these ones stick out for reasons, for reasons I'll describe. So in August 2017, a Saudi petrochem uh, petrochemical plant was attacked. So when they compromised the industrial control systems on the, on the actual manufacturing floor, so basically, they disabled the safeties so a plant overload could occur and basically blow it up. You could basically turn the entire plant into a bomb. It's a petrochemical plant. What do you think happens when someone lights a match? It goes up. Okay? There's a lot more science for that, but you know what I mean. Um, in December 2015, the, Ukra uh, the Ukrainian SCADA attack, so that was perpetuated by Russia. Okay? It, well, not officially, technically, but everyone knows who did it. And that was a result of any number of different international issues, the civil war in the Ukraine, all kinds of things going on. And so what they did is they targeted the electrical grid, they targeted nuclear power plants, they disabled the electrical grid for the Ukraine in several areas. And that affected the civilian population in such a way that it's just not conceivable in a way if you actually look at the context of the laws of war, because you can't target things civilians need. It's as simple as that. If it harms their everyday life, you're violating the laws of war. In 2013, there was the Rybrook New York Dam attack, and they contributed that to Iraq. 
So basically, this is kind of the early days when people started getting really worried about critical infrastructure. This is one of the major events that really set everyone off. So it was a small dam in New York. It wasn't that big of a deal. And it didn't compromise anything that would cause any kind of loss of life. But Chinese, uh, no, Iranian hackers, rather, were able to gain access to the network. If they wanted to, they could open up things, they could compromise the dam, they could flood the area, however many different things they could do. They could compromise electric uh, generation, they could do all kinds of different things, and that's the scary part. What happens if someone hacks, um, let's say, a, a dam, and they flood the town, if if possible, depending on construction, things like that, I'm not an engineer, no uh, But the thing is, that possibility is there, and that's what we have to deal with. In April 2007, one of the earlier mentions of cyber warfare is when they didn't target really any kind of physical infrastructure such as dams, electric grids. They targeted financial institutions. They started targeted government institutions. They targeted parliament themselves, the parliament themselves of Estonia, and that was by Russia. That was in retaliation for a political move because Estonia got rid of the Soviet statue, and Russia wasn't exactly proud of that. And they weren't very happy about that. And so they took it out of Estonia, where they crippled their entire cyber infrastructure for a couple weeks. They couldn't access bank accounts. They couldn't access government websites. Basic services were denied. These kind of things can hurt civilian populations and governments and states in such a severe way. And they knew what they were doing. They've done the same thing when they, uh, they invited uh, Georgia. When the Russians invaded Georgia, um, several years ago, they were able to dis disable the entire command and control structure of the Georgian military through a cyber attack. Now, that wasn't exactly cyber warfare at the same time it was, because they weren't targeting civilians, they weren't violating the rules of war, because they targeted the military infrastructure. They disabled the communications, and communications and warfare is the key to any battle. Information and communication can win or lose any nation, any empire, it doesn't matter who it is. You lose that, you lose. So one of the first physical retaliations of the cyber attack actually happened last week. So Israel, uh, as they mentioned uh, in the media, and the Israeli uh, military Twitter account announced that Hezbollah uh, contributed a cyber attack against them, targeting military infrastructure. And one of the problems with that is, is that Israel stopped the attack, or so they say. The details on what they targeted, what happened, who did what, are still sketchy, because this happened last week. And the Israelis aren't actually big on uh, sharing information, which I'm sure many people can agree with. Okay? But what they did was they dropped a drone strike on it, and they annihilated the building. That building right there isn't there anymore. And that's a mock photo of a drone strike. You get the idea. All right? and that's the first instance of anyone targeting someone as a retaliation of a cyber attack. Now, what were to happen if the rules of war were changed? Because the problem with rules of war right now as cybersecurity is involved and cyber warfare is that a cyber warfare act has to have a physical action. So in order to be an act of war against another nation state from another state, you have to cause physical damage. You have to cause loss of life. Okay? So this wasn't something that caused loss of life. This wasn't something that caused an explosion like in the Saudi petrochemical plant. This was they attacked a military network and they blew them up. This is unprecedented, it's never happened before. Minus there was an assassination of a uh, terrorist hacker, I believe they were from Al-Qaeda, uh, where the US did a drone strike on an Al-Qaeda hacker because they revealed the private information of US military personnel, government officials, etc., uh, basically to harm them, to allow them to be targeted. And so they dropped the drone on them and they killed them. That's the only other uh, only other time that they've actually used the physical means to stop a cyber attack. Other times, it's uh, sanctions. It's uh, uh, different things on the Russian government, different things on the Chinese government, hurting their economy, due to uh, uh, perpetuating another cyber attack on them. It's never actually a physical thing. And when it comes to warfare now, the door has been opened. And so when it comes to an international law perspective, we now have to address this as, what are we going to do now? Where does it go from here? If we continue down the path of just not addressing it, we're just going to have a constant, I guess you could say, game of uh, zero-sum game, where people are just competing for notoriety and the, for the will of it their own. It doesn't actually solve the problems that we have. If we address things, we outlaw um, targeting infrastructure that could harm civilians, targeting infrastructure that could harm a nation state. Uh, let's say if someone hacked, um, let's say, 
uh, Wall Street, which shut down the world economy, the world's largest economy in America. That would be a massive incident that would affect the entire world. But technically, it's not exactly as an act of war, because it's not a physical threat. It doesn't cause a loss of life, or so is how the law defines it. And so this is the problem that we run into. This is why the U.S. Secretary General is behind this. This is why numerous generals and mil multiple militaries, different government officials, the U.S., the U.K., and multiple countries abroad are all in agreement that things need to be changed. But the problem is, is once you do this, you open up the door to retaliation. Because it's not just China or Russia that I've mentioned, or Iran, or Iran that we all like to talk about. The United States does this. Brazil does this. Every country in the world does these kind of acts. Now, none of them are as good as, say, Russia, China, and the United States, or Israel, because those guys just don't mess with the feelings. Um, but it, the problem is, is where do we go from here? And so what needs to happen is you, the United Nations, the international community needs to understand this. They need to talk about this. And they're really not. Uh, I mean, the U.S. Secretary General will talk about it at a speech at university, but that doesn't really solve the problem. That's basically me put, making a social media post and saying, hey, this is a problem. We should do something about this. not actually doing anything. You, know, you all know what I'm talking about. You see this on, on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Hey, let's do something. But it doesn't change anything. And so this is the kind of issues that we run into. Um, so when it comes to cyber warfare, we're kind of in an interesting area where we could literally go anywhere. We could consider with the status quo. We could not progress further and address these issues and limit the amount they can target civilians and target and affect our lives. If someone were to hack the power grid in London, I think we'd all be pretty pissed right now, wouldn't we? You know, it's like if I don't get home and I get to watch Netflix at home, I'm going to be a pretty angry guy. And that's what it comes down to. Yeah, maybe Netflix is, a, is a, not a trigger for you guys, it is for me. <laughs> uh, that's my bread and butter right there. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's the kind of situation we find ourselves in. Um, and what needs to happen is nation states need to come together like they used before. Everyone universally condemned genocide, that's a no-brainer. Everyone no universally condemned chemical weapons, mustard gas, these things, that, these atrocities that happened in the First World War, Second World War. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but hopefully I'm loud enough. Um, but these kind of atrocities that happens, we don't view them the same way as we do cyber. And as I keep hitting on this in this talk, we need to address this. And with that, uh, I think I have kind of got to the end of that. I just want to get it, keep it brief and keep it educational. I don't want to go too deep into the legalese because not everyone is a big kind of international politics, politics nerd like I am. Um, but with that, uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, you, you talk quite a lot about state-on-state -state attacks, uh, and I was wondering if you uh, have much of an opinion on uh, non-state actors and uh, what international law implications there may be. I mean, uh, the Geneva Convention was written back when you know, the nation-state was the predominant enemy or the defender, um, uh, but also international law is, doesn't exist in international exactly as rooted in in sovereign national law, so I don't know if international law could uh, work against a uh, state actor. So be that's interesting because at the same time, like I said, it's um, like I said before, it's not exactly what you believe in, it's what you can do before, right? So international law is how I would describe as it's it, again, like I said before, it's rigid. It's there, everyone, there are consequences to violating it, there are protections there that stop you. But at the same time, it depends on your interpretation. Uh, you could have a different interpretation, uh, the same way the different laws of war change with different nation states. Uh, the, the, for example, the United States is a very different example of what is acceptable for civilian casualties and targeting different military targets than, let's say, the Russians, or the Cubans, or even the Canadians, because every country has their own opinion. When it comes to non-state actors, well, who do you hold accountable? Now, do you hold the state that harbors them accountable? Uh, do we invade them like we invaded uh, Afghanistan, the United States, when the Taliban was active because of uh, supposed uh, Al Qaeda ties? Uh, do we target those nation state, uh, non state groups? But at the same time, what happens when a non state actor is still affiliated with a state actor? Um, because you'll see things like, uh, for example, the Russian business network in Russia, where they utilize a criminal network sometimes to cover up their own hacking attacks. Uh, if it's not the FSB, if it's not the Russian military intelligence, it's usually the Russian Business Network, 
who are doing something for the Russian government. And that's what happened. It's, it's so complex, honestly, I wouldn't even know how to answer that because it depends on your point of view. Thank you. Attribution, because in the end of the day, uh, I figured the key part of the vault is, is how we can either retaliate or help someone accountable that those people actually did do. If you are, let's say, savvy enough, it's really hard to actually attribute this to a specific person or sometimes even a group. And then come to the distinction is this, is this propaganda, is this reality, and where we stand with that. And how can you actually prove that in the court of law? regardless if it's national or international. Again, like I said before, it's not what you believe, it's what you can prove in court. And that holds true on the international stage and the local stage. But you have people being killed, not for the first time, but for the second. And can we actually prove that those people were targeting the Israeli military network? At the moment, no, because, uh, well, to be, uh, be fair, this happened last week. And like I said before, the Israelis aren't exactly forthcoming with their intelligence. Uh, now, uh, I've never been in the military. I do know a thing or two because I've studied it most of my life. Military tactics, strategy, how they operate. And so when it comes to military targeting, I would say with confidence that there was probably a number of other factors aside from that cyber attack that led them to target that building. Okay, it's not just cyber. They probably had human intelligence, other different intelligence sources. There's other reasons to target that building. But still, they retaliated. And for them, it's probably a good PR moment. You know, with, and also right now with Israel, we've seen unprecedented levels of hostility between Israel and Gaza and the West Bank and Southern Israel. We've seen a lot of activity there in the last couple of weeks. It's, that has not happened in recent years. So you also have to take that into account. It could be that maybe someone jumped the gun because there was a cyber attack. I'm not calling the Israelis a liar. I'm not about to say that. He tweets. He changes the world, literally. All right? You came out from China can be state sponsored can be a group of uh, nationalists that wants to preserve the image of China and attack whoever is attacking China. Again, goes back to the same point, attribution, at the end of the day. It does. And like I said, it, it's tough to answer. Uh, I wish I was a lawyer and had an answer for that. <laughs> All right, this is the devil's advocate question. I mean, it's pretty normal for a step in a military operation, you know, a war, to disrupt, you know, command, control, communications, intelligence. Like you said, it's a building doing human intelligence, other things potentially. Is it really that different? What is it? Why does cyber magically make this completely different than taking out a communication system or a propaganda bureau? To be honest, it really doesn't. It honestly doesn't. It just depends whether or not what justification they use. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to because uh, the justification they use is. Uh, if a, a terrorist uh, goes into a, they're able to link communication between a suicide bomber and a group in, let's say, that building. Let's say this guy, uh, someone in that building, I'm touching things in my pocket. I'll switch back. Oh, my um, but, uh, yeah, where was I? Um, there are different factors that happen there. It's the justification that happens. Uh, like I said, when it comes to international law, it, these things certain limit things, certain things. Um, example I could use is uh, if anyone's familiar with the right to protect international law. That affects a lot of things, but it's incredibly open to interpretation. It's a version of that was used uh, in many instances for um, the, uh, the Rwanda uh, genocide intervention, which arguably the international military intervention did nothing to affect the genocide, but it's justification. It depends on how you justify what you're going to do. Um, and laying down the framework just basically allows you to target people. Because once the laws come into place where they're doing certain things, let's say if they were to enact an international law, everybody in the world signs it, okay? Like a Geneva Convention where all these states ratify it. Um, and they enable it that if you attack a military infrastructure with a cyber attack, doesn't matter what you're doing, you could be stealing some guy's email password or doing a phishing campaign, you could be penetrating um, anything, you could be trying to turn someone's lights on and off again, okay? And what if you change the justification for striking them militarily to that? Any attempt on the infrastructure is an attempt on us. That's an act of war. It, it depends on how you justify it and what, what people recognize. Uh, picking up on that and the fact of the critical infrastructures, um, all critical infrastructures have to be used militarily to build. The internet itself was developed exactly because of that to create a network that will allow 
um, the U.S. military back in the archives for the communication network to survive any nuclear attack. But still, today, it is dual use. It's a civilian use. And it's also a military use. So, power grids, communications, telecoms, internet, and so on. Are you distinct between one and the other? Again, it comes down to interpretation. It comes down, it, I, I'm, I know I'm beating a dead horse here. I really am. Uh, but it really does come down to interpretation. Um, how you justify a military target versus a civilian target is very different. I mean, there's plenty of cases where uh, you could arguably use the laws of war. Um, use, uh, it's not international laws of war, just a different countries, you know, uh, uh, procedure of operations, how they justify targeting certain targets. Um, you could use that to justify targeting that area. And it comes down to justification and your point of view, because one nation state, one group, they're going to have one interpretation of that international law, and that's their, their interpretation. Now, whether or not that interpretation sits with everyone else, whether or not that can squeeze through legalese, uh, similar to like uh, how they justify the Iraq invasion in international law, which is a very funny subject, uh, because uh, they use the same argument that the United States used to invade Iraq that uh, Russia used to invade Syria. They just copied the same thing and changed some words around and like, here you go. It depends on your interpretation. Uh, I, again, I'm being a dead horse, but that's what it comes down to. India's Japanese mission control a couple of three power First of all, is, is that someone uh, the International Court of Justice drafting laws of dispute in terms of cyber security and in terms of dealing with that kind of situation? Because that's not uh, a physical aspect, it's a new thing, but like cyber work the last few years is it's becoming a normal. And then the second thing, like who's responsible for pushing the people drafting those laws? Would that be the UN and everybody who's part of the UN and all the UN states? Or would that be affected states? pushing forward uh, drafts or initial reports to the National Court of Justice that would require something to be dealt with. What's in your opinion? All right, so well, repeat that again and just and The first one is the International Court of Justice is at the moment drafting any laws in terms of cyber security and dealing with uh, extremely circumstances or any events like this one. And second, like who's responsible to push the International Court of Justice actually draft any laws to deal with that? Um, well, I'm not going to talk out of turn because to be honest, I can't answer that question. Uh, I have not looked at recent legislation, um, so I couldn't tell you. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn and talk up my ass here, um, but uh, I couldn't answer that for you. Um, that's, a, that's a whole different ball game you could talk about. Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, I just saw him yesterday. He, he had a video he posted. Um, is the cybersecurity uh, head for the UN. Um, someone like that would be more responsible. You can see different nation states uh, support different legislation, support holding other different actors accountable. Um, but it depends on well, kind of what they want to happen. I mean, uh, will the United States do that? Will China do that? Will Brazil do that? It depends on their own interests. Uh, everything in the UN depends <coughs> on politics. I mean, we, we, we can act like the UN is a governing body, which it is in many respects, but in different ways. It kind of depends on the motivation behind it because eventually you have to get a consensus with people and politics is politics. And whatever they push through is going to be onto their own agenda. Uh, and how whatever they push through in the International Court of Justice, holding people accountable, these different things, is going to have ramifications for different groups. Um, now, I'm probably talking in circles here, um, but that's the best I can do for you. Anybody else? Yeah. So, but isn't cyber attack sort of covered by international? Because it, you mentioned mustard gas. Yeah. Mustard gas is banned for other reasons, right? Uh, cyber attack is like kinetic warfare. If you attack, you know, a, a, a bunch of school children, it's the target there that is illegal, immoral, whatever. If you attack soldiers, you know, the, the new next generation military systems are all IP connected, etc. Then it's a legitimate military target. And it's the target that determines the justification, not the uh, method of action against that target. Exactly. It, the, the target is what it comes down to. And again, it's also what you consider a, <coughs> an act of war. Because uh, let's say one strike on a military target, um, again, like uh, if you cause physical harm, as the international laws of war currently cover, you, for a cyber attack to actually be an act of war, it has to cause physical damage. So you can attack 
a military target and let's say cause a blow up, that'd be an act of war. Um, if you attack a military target and turn all their coffee machines so they don't work, that's not exactly an act of war. It probably is. No, I mean, it's a good example, but you know what I mean. Uh, it, it depends on what happens. And if you had a cyber attack that you know, killed the civilian population of the city, that would be a crime against humanity. That would be a crime against humanity. It would be a war crime. It would be an act of war. Because if someone dropped a nuke on, let's say, London, that would be an act of war, right? If they, let's say, I don't know, uh, for some reason Scotland wanted independence. They took control of the nukes that were in the north that they have, and they just bombed England. Would that be an act of war? Depends yes. on the part of England. What? Depends on the part of England. True, 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 true. Slow. <laughs> that would be an act of war, right? And so it, de it depends on what you define as an act of war. Uh, let's say I were to go over to this guy and I would kick him in the face. Is that an act of war? I'm not going to. Alright. Uh, but let's say I were to go over and I would awkwardly stare at him. Is that an act of war? It's a very simplistic way of explaining it, but how you define it and how you justify it is, is what it comes down to. It comes down to law. Like uh, if, uh, like for example, I use the states again, because that's what I'm most familiar with. Sorry, I'm American. Um, uh, let's say you uh, you assault someone. Okay. If I assault you with my fist, it's a different charge. All right, that's assault. If I assault you with a golf club, that's assault with a deadly weapon. It depends on what you're doing and what the context is, and how you do it. So picking up on your example about uh, society re-engineering, uh, where you put, for example, media, because there are different medias spreading different propaganda. Can you tell me that uh, I would say? Because they're trying to push their own agenda, depending on who's behind that. It can be uh, economical group, can be uh, sponsored, and independent. You have to say, for example, things like WikiLeaks. How do you juggle about that? That's where it gets confusing, because uh, like I talked about before, when it comes between cyber espionage or cyber, well espionage is not the exact same thing, or cyber warfare. But for example, you could use, um, I'll use a case of uh, information warfare. Uh, in Afghanistan, the Taliban has used several uh, acts where basically they'll do mass texting uh, campaigns and they'll text uh, guards uh, at different checkpoints from Afghanistan military forces and they'll basically convince them that there's a giant invasion coming to their little checkpoint and convince them to leave the uh, checkpoint they're at because they're like, oh, well, if there's 10 of us here and there's 100 of them coming, do we stand a chance? And that's, again, a different way of viewing it. Um, but one person propaganda is a different thing. You could use, uh, for example, the Russian state and many of the Russian people, uh, they re view the, uh, the uh, what's it, the Moscow Times, or. Uh, the no, Russian RT media. Yeah, RT. RT, RT. Yeah, for propaganda. example. Yeah, that could be considered propaganda by other people. Other people are considered a very good, great journalist. Uh, again, it depends on your interpretation. Um, for example, you could consider Al Jazeera, which arguably they do have incredibly good uh, journalistic skills. I'll give them that. Like, they have very, they have very good journalists. They do a good job. But arguably, there's a big propaganda component to what a lot of the articles they publish. And you can actually see an agenda. It's been studied many times. So one person's propaganda is another person's truth. Again, it depends on what your point of view is. So basically, it's whoever has the power decides. <laughs> That's, That's the rule of new. life, to be honest. <laughs> or the money, or both. Yeah, whoever's got the biggest pick. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>